Welcome everyone, thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Chris Alfano and I want to talk to you about a Habitat for Democracy and, and how we build it. Has anyone ever seen this show? <laughs> I can't claim to be a Trekkie, but I've always deeply admired Star Trek for promoting an optimistic vision of the future. Uh, Star Trek paints a future where automation scaled to the max has created a more just and equal society and there's no sinister catch. It's a future where technology has been put in service of maximizing human potential, unlocking the ability of every individual to explore their own curiosity and creativity. I think this vision is really important to hold on to in the face of the more common dystopian vision that sometimes might look a little more likely. We need to, we need to hold this in mind and I think, hold this in mind and always consider whether we're building towards that future or towards the more dystopian. So imagine I'm at some tech networking event trying to explain why I think Habitat is cool to some DevOps veteran I just met. And I tell them it's cool because you can run an app and a database in the same container. Does anyone have an idea what I'd hear? That won't scale, I hate this phrase. We use it as a cudgel to shut down any line of thinking that doesn't conform to what is ultimately a very narrow view of scale and the sort of success we want it to take us to. Scale as we use it almost always describes building some central web property that, and then capturing millions of users as fast as possible. With this session, I hope to get you all thinking about some different shapes scale can take and the different definitions of success that your automations and platforms could, could bring. After a couple stories about my own entry point into automation and civic hacking, I'll share how I think Habitat offers exciting new paths to what I've taken to call in human, human scale and some of the off-label uses I've experimented with. So this is my first website. Welcome to Cheater's Retreat. I built this in middle school almost 20 years ago, completely oblivious to what the future connotation of the, of the t title might be. All I wanted was a place to share cheat codes for Nintendo 64 that you could uh, browse, search, or print. Uh, somehow this site and its CGI bin full of Perl scripts and flash animations are still online almost 20 years later uh, Tripad has managed to innovate uh, some flash and some, some more ads into all my frames, but somehow the backend code all still works. I had written some HTML and CSS before on the free static web hosts of the day, but when I discovered that I could write backend code on Tripod, I started to see, started fundamentally looking at the world in a different way. Suddenly a website could not just broadcast my information, it could build its own information and it could connect people together. I never finished it and no one ever used it. And I certainly never got funded, but I did get to put it online where others could find it. And somehow someone did. Another middle schooler named Jeff, just a couple days off from me in age, but clear on the other side of the country, somehow came across it and he came across my call for collaboration. He hit me up on AIM and we partnered in learning and building together for years to come. Somehow, in all the time since, it has not gotten much easier for a kid to put something dynamic online, where they can find their collaborators and leave it there. Cloud9 here, which was a great option for a while, has gone the way that most options eventually seem to. Amazon bought, the, bought them and shut it down. Uh, they're folding it into their new offerings. I've used it with some kids. You need a credit card to go very far. It's, it's, they're not prioritizing this audience. Having, have online storage and computing resources become prohibitively expensive for hosting things that get next to zero traffic? Have we just given up that spammers and rogue crypto miners are gonna ruin anything we open up? Try sitting down with a middle schooler today and walking them through how to make a, a page with a form that posts to a database and then another page that lists things out from that database. A pretty simple project, you'd think, and pretty foundational to building uh, things that connect people. In practice, it's a disaster of tangents into irrelevant tools and incantations and dead ends of mandatory credit cards and pivoted startups. The team at Glitch are doing awesome work in this space, but why can't kids play in the real world with real tools instead of in pens connected to freemium accounts at startups that will evaporate before they change schools? Around the same time, I somehow found this game, Solar Empire. It had nowhere near this much polish when I found it, but it was the oldest screenshot I could find on SourceForge. It was a turn-based game where you click links to explore star systems, mine resources, buy ships, build bases, and attack other clans. I made a lot of random internet friends, and even better, I got all my real-life friends at school playing too. One day, Brian, the coder in Utah who built it back when you could make a living having banner ads on a site called Cooltext, decided he didn't have time to maintain the game anymore and dumped the whole thing on SourceForge. I eagerly downloaded the zip file, ready to double-click the installer and start my own Solar Empire server. What I found instead was a wall of PHP 3 scripts, 
mortared together with Pearl, Bash, Aux, Set, and SQL. Things I'd never seen before and had no idea what to do with. I was looking for the exe file. Uh, luckily, I was able to get a hold of the original developer on ICQ Messenger. Um, if anyone still has that, 688-35635, that's me. Uh, and he offered just enough hand-holding uh, to get me far enough that I wouldn't give up before I had it working on my Windows 98 desktop. Uh, once I got to the point where I could change some code, see the result, and share it with my friends over my not yet blocked port 80 on my new cable connection, nothing ever would be the same for me again. I discovered the most powerful force of curiosity, determination, and creativity on the planet. Giving a 15-year-old who doesn't know what they can't do yet a way to lord over their friends in a shared play space. It terrifies me to look back now and think about all the things that could have derailed me. I lucked out at every turn. I might not have had a computer I could install things on, like a lot of kids do today with Chromebooks. I might not have had a broadband internet connection with a stable IP. Brian might not have helped me get to the fun part before I got too frustrated. I might not have been able to run what I needed to on my system. I had no credit card, and my mom certainly wouldn't have given me hers. Picking up other developers' projects is hard. Getting them running on systems they weren't designed for is hard. Getting past all the plumbing just so you can run the thing, make a change, and see it work is hard. Even getting something running on a system it was designed for, but on a newer release a couple years later, is hard. You need the permission and effort of an expert to be a beginner. My ambitions then moved to making money with my new skills. I picked up a bunch of freelance coding gigs online pretending I was an adult. Uh, apologies, the flash doesn't work on uh, the Wayback Machine. Um, with one of my collaborators, who I eventually learned was also a kid in Toronto, uh, we built a little niche community site for teenagers in Toronto who like techno music and all ages parties. It blew up as much as something like that could, and soon we were running clones of the site for four different communities in Toronto, each with its own whole theme extensions and special features. There's really nothing notable about these sites. Uh, once MySpace eventually came out, we were crushed under their scale. We still had more to offer with our niche, and loyal followers remained for a little while, but MySpace sucked enough oxygen out of the room that the future looked too dead end to continue. A lot stuck with me, though, from this time on how online spaces can create shapes within which communities can grow, how sometimes the right scale isn't global, but local that local communities can be scaled not just by centralizing them on a grand platform, but by clustering together local efforts, each with their own subtle flavors, so they can share and build on top of what's common not, and not be confined to what's common. That there's power in matching online space with real world space, and that there's a rarely explored space between forking and configuring that is vital to scaling out this way. You need to be able to extend and compose entire online environments to give all the local communities their online shapes. At the time, I didn't see these lessons, though, and I promptly turned my ambitions towards going the way of MySpace and Facebook. I was always frustrated with how tech had changed everything online, but at my school, it was only a room we got to visit sometimes, and I determined that what I needed to do was build a MySpace for school that made learning as fun in school as it had been for me out of school online. We'd skip past all those pesky teachers who would only slow down our growth and go right to the kids instead so we could grow at internet speeds and reach massive scale. We'd make the world a better place by bypassing teachers in schools so we could make a really busy website that provided the one best environment for learning online. I think now that that idea is uh, pretty indicative of the attitude we as an industry tend to take towards the world. Uh, and nothing seems to make that as painful to think about as the show Silicon Valley. Because everyone else is still using paper instead of computers, we know everyone else is doing it wrong, right? We know better and we just need to disrupt the paper pushers out of the way to make the world a better place. Another lucky break was in store for me, though. I dropped out of business school because I thought teachers weren't going as fast as the internet, and I felt I'd missed the train. And I was about to make them obsolete with my PHP scripts anyway. <laughs> Within my first couple of weeks being unfettered to fix the world, I happened upon a listing for this event uh, at a bar in the neighborhood I moved into in Philly. Uh, Ignite talks are held regularly in cities all over the world, and they are a great way to learn what folks are working on in your community. One of the last talks I saw of the night was by this guy, Chris Lehman a coder turned English teacher turned high school principal and founder, uh, and he founded a new kind of public school that he opened in partnership with the Ben Franklin Science Museum in Philadelphia. It was called the Science Leadership Academy. The school was in its third year and sounded like everything I had ever dreamed a school could be. Kids all had laptops that they could take home. They could build things for the real world. They were being prepared to be citizens, not workers. All their work was project-based and inquiry-driven. Community was at the core of everything, and most importantly, it was built on the premise that public education equals democracy. If you can distribute the knowledge and the means to shape the world equitably at the ground level in our public schools, healthy democracy will follow eventually. He talked about how certain technologies are not additive, but transformative. 
he gave the example that when Europe gained the printing press, you didn't have Europe plus the printing press, you had a whole new Europe. So why, shouldn't, why should schools just be schools plus computers? They should be whole new schools. But he said that technology in schools should be like oxygen, ubiquitous, necessary, and invisible. And I thought, ubiquitous? That sounds good. Necessary, hell yeah. Invisible? No, 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 no. How do I, how do I scale that and exit that? Ubiquitous and necessary sounds like a good business model. Invisible sounds like a pretty dumb idea. But this guy's actually running a school, and it, it seemed to be working. He closed the talk asking for assistant men to come join his efforts. Maybe it was because he said he could only, when, he, when he said he could only pay 35, I thought that meant dollars per hour. But somehow, I was the only coder who applied. By the time I found out he meant 35K a year, I, I figured it was too late, and, and I should at least give it a try. And I'm so glad I did. But again, it's scary how close I came to missing this opportunity and how ill-equipped our schools are to build technology that works for them. When I got to the school, I found an absolutely incredible and inspiring place. Kids loved learning and being at the school. Teachers were excited and felt supported. There were four systems students and teachers had to log into, and my job became keeping them all working, keeping them all up to date with users and classes, and helping people with their logins. Uh, we had Moodle, an open source workspace for classrooms. We had School Tool, an open source reporting and tracking tool for staff. Um, we had Drupal Ed, a public website for the school that kids could publish to, and Squirrel Mail and PostFix for email. Shout out to Squirrel Mail, if anyone remembers that. This was a fully open source stack that the principal had set up himself. Uh, he hadn't been a coder in a few years, but he was good enough to find things that people had built already, follow instructions, get them running, and, and hack at the bits he needed to. They weren't integrated much at all beyond running in the same server in the basement of the science museum. Um, but it turns out schools can be really good at hacking the technological leftovers they're stuck with into what they need. And there are some vibrant communities of practice where new tools and tricks are shared. The most interesting piece in this equation, though, was Drupal Ed. An educational technologist by the name of Funny Monkey built and maintained Drupal Ed back then for the fledgling community of school 2.0 pioneers that wanted to give kids the tools of publishing online from inside the school. He took the foundation of Drupal, installed a theme and a set of plugins, that would be useful for a school, layered on a set of customizations and configuration on top of that, and then zipped the whole thing up and put it online to distribute. On top of that, our principal then layered his own tweaks and customizations after installing it. Now, picture what my life was like every time a Drupal core or plugin security update came out. It was a shit show. The situation clearly wasn't tenable, but did the only alternative really need to be switching to a fully managed SaaS solution where we could only customize within the bounds of what the creators foresaw? where 99 out of 100 possible future outcomes were the SaaS company shutting down, pivoting into something else, getting acquired by a textbook publisher and sunsetted, or in the best, most likely scenario, getting frozen in time for a few years and not evolving with our needs? Should Funny Monkey have aspired to turn his practice into a full-time SaaS business, hosting a massive multi-tenant infrastructure for everyone so he could keep them in lockstep with his latest code and feature set? What if the people doing the best innovation in the classroom don't want to do that? Is that even success for everyone? I think this is the arrangement that a lot of internet era entrepreneurs imagine when they picture building software for schools. This is the model, th this model really doesn't work for schools. It takes four years for one kid to get through school. How many internet startups even last that long? This model just doesn't work. We've heard stories of schools trying five times to get away from one of the monolithic vendors in this space, only to keep having their new system acquired and sunsetted by the same vendor over and over again. When you're exploring new ways to teach and build learning communities, the technology has to follow the practice, not the other way around. Further, in the case of public schools, we're spending public money. Uh -oh. We're spending public money building these systems. Schools need to have rights as users to the software they build their practice on if they're ever really going to get the most out of technology, and we really need them to. For example, the right to keep using it after the vendor pivots or gets acquired, the right to change and improve software if their practice evolves in a different direction and the right to share their improvements with and between peer schools. I think we need to see something a little more like this, a, a scaffolded chaos that taps the massive scale of creativity and experience that we have on the ground in our schools already, where projects can be developed at multiple tiers like Drupal Ed was, branched out into different flavors at any number of levels, and hosted within independent but economic clusters of trust. The only thing keeping a model like this from being scalable is that it doesn't fit the shape of tools and practices we develop to generate returns for venture capitalists. But what if this were where we applied our creativity and ingenuity? I started experimenting with this model about six years ago, 
creating a platform I called Emergence to explore how to facilitate multi-tiered development and independent clustered hosting. Here's a little video. All right, so at this initial screen, what you see is that we're running three services, Nginx, MySQL, PHP. We've got a list of sites, uh, which are basically instances or environments. Um, and we're, what we're trying to do here is bring the same economics that get brought to branches to running spaces. So let's say I want to start a chef school. I, I fill out uh, a name for the school, I give it an ID, I assign it a host name, and here's the interesting part. I pick a parent site. So what we're trying to do is kind of bring the same model of development to whole environments that we have for object-oriented programming, where you base one thing on another. In this case, I picked uh, from a preset uh, template site, and I have a key for it. And then I pick a initial user to, to set up when I create it. And a moment later, the instance is online. One of the constraints is that everything must be automated to get the thing running. Uh, I believe firmly that if you really want to democratize the ability to, to build applications like this, you have, to, you have to enable people to start from zero. They have to be able to take the thing out of the box and run it just like you could a desktop computer before they learn how it works. So I can log in with that initial user I had. Um, and this could be the home page for a school. Uh, you might have an internal dashboard for users where they can get into their tools. Uh, but the, the really interesting and powerful piece here was that you could go to slash develop and get to a crude IDE that will let you edit code on the spot. So imagine sitting in a classroom with 30 kids following along who don't have infrastructure. They have Chromebooks, most likely. Uh, they don't have Azure accounts or uh, Amazon accounts. Um, so you can go ahead and uh, edit some markdown, change the, the text of the site, the little welcome box, welcome to chef school. Uh, you can uh, edit some configuration code one of the interesting things here is that all these, all the folders you said are empty, and so I'm looking under this top one here, parent, all the inherited code, change the, the site slogan to work, 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 like the chef says. Um, we had the system you know, track all the edits so you didn't really need to learn Git, it just saved everything, just space is cheap. Drop chef logo in there. And then the system reacts to the changes I make. All the, all the ops are hooked up to, file, to, to the content. So that all worked right away. Now here's the interesting bit. You'll notice what I just did was right click and go create inheriting site. So I've just pre-filled in my own parent site. So the parent site could be a template or it could be any other school. So let's say I'm starting Habitat School now and I want to base it on Chef School. Fill in the same thing I did before. Pick a user, and I'm in. So this isn't super interesting. Um, you know, the services behind the scenes are all powered by Habitat, but what Habitat brings to the table now is the ability to have applications bring in any sort of service or code. Next. So on top of and alongside Emergence, inside the school with all the teachers and students, we started building Slate, an open toolkit for building schools and communities online, building school communities online. Um, Slate provides an online home for the school where everyone in a community uh, can publish, much like Drupal Ed did. Um, but recognizing that there was no such thing as a single ultimate tool for schools, uh, Slate prioritized two other aspects too, uh, providing an extensible data and session pipeline and providing a cheap, maintainable space for hosting mini applications. Slate became the glue for the school's online world that stayed with the school year over year and evolved with it. Slate realized part of the dream of making technology in the classroom invisible. Teachers no longer had to spend time, spend class time getting kids into their tools. They just told the kids to sign into the website. Open their class and whatever else they needed to would be uh, right there already signed in. Maybe even more importantly, it dropped the mental and manual overhead of trying new tools to nearly zero. Teachers could try new tools in their practice and it was just another link on students' dashboards, not a whole nother login for them to manage. Over time, my company, Jarvis Innovations, started, started up and I switched to working on Slate from there full time, eventually partnering with three other major nonprofit organizations that were leading the way in new school models. Uh, these three groups were um, leaders, thought leaders in progressive education, 
uh, and we built different sub-distributions of Slate that helped achieve and iterate the different learning models that they were experimenting with. Uh, and those groups opened more schools and other independent schools and groups built off of their pioneering work. Our rule has been one community equals one instance. Every instance can be hosted on its own or in a shared cluster, and every instance can be based on an upstream template or any other school. Emergence stopped significantly evolving a while ago. It worked well enough for my team to focus on the classroom, um, and I, I could do a whole talk on just what we've learned exploring that space. Uh, but what I'll leave it at for now is that I'm figuring out how to redo the whole thing for the cloud native era on top of Habitat, and I would love to talk to anyone, in, anyone else interested in exploring open, multi-tiered environments for development of communities. Emergence needs a lot of work to be viable for today's developers and platforms, but this, the model it enabled was golden, and I think teaches us some things about the shape of the tools and scale we need to make technology and automation a force for distributing uh, power instead of concentrating it. After working on Slate in schools for years, it was incredible to me how much innovation is happening out on the ground in public education and in public services as a whole. And for the most part, Silicon Valley is working against it, let alone helping. The brightest minds are modernizing toll booths rather than getting rid of them. Shiny new tools come and go faster than a teacher can graduate a kid. Uh, and schools have no rights, no autonomy, no agency, and no safety with anything backed by venture capitalists. It doesn't matter how useful tools are, only whether they can generate an appropriate return in an appropriate time frame. I think we can do better. While I was still a, in a tech closet working on Slate, uh, a nonprofit called Code for America was starting up with the mission of proving that government can work for the people, by the people, in the digital age. The theory goes that strengthening democracy must start with building people's faith and confidence that government can work well. And with software eating the world, we're at a precipice. Either government and the collective good will be left behind, or it will lead the way. I find this idea incredibly energizing. I can't imagine what it takes to make people believe and participate in an abstract idea like democracy, but I'm sure you all, all you optimizers and automators, have plenty of ideas how to make government work better, both nationally and at home in your own community. Code for America's vision is that services can be simple, accessible, and easy to use. That outcomes can be measurably better, that better can cost less, and that we can serve everyone with respect and dignity. How do we get all the expertise we need working to better the commons in these ways? Government can and is hiring more talent every day at every level, federal, state, and local. So-called digital services teams are popping up all over now, but that's nowhere near enough. Code for America's first program was a fellowship that recruited technologists to learn about government at their San Francisco headquarters and then dispatched them to work in a handful of partner cities, including my own of Philadelphia. The Code for America fellows hosted hackathons and happy hours, built projects, got people connected, and laid the groundwork for government as a service, human-centered design, and, do, and digital services teams in government. They were doing the same thing I was doing in schools, but a lot more thoughtfully and better resourced in city halls across the country. Cities have been called the laboratories of democracy and indeed provided the perfect starting place for Code for America, which now focuses much of its in-house work at the national and federal level. In their wake, from my relatively unique position, half in the tech scene and half in the public sector, I felt a groundswell of untapped energy. Technologists wanting to make a difference, public servants wanting better technology. In reality, public servants are all nerds in their own stripe, and they love nerding out with anyone who will listen about their systems and processes and all the hacks they employ to make government and public services work. I started talking about starting a local volunteer civic hacking group and soon learned I wasn't the only one. The Code for America Brigade Network, nearly five years ago now, was born. Along with about a dozen other groups, I got, help, I got to help start a local affiliate called Code for Philly. Starting a Code for America Brigade basically consisted of getting a tech company to let us use their office space once a week, posting a hack night on meetup.com, and buying pizza when we could, and taking every meeting I could get with people that wanted to contribute or already were contributing and needed help. Currently today, there are 76 official Code for America Brigade groups around the United States. And all over the world, there are hundreds of groups affiliated under the banner Code for All. Together, we are civic hackers, people who show up outside our day job and look for people solving problems who need technology. Notice I didn't say we solve problems with technology. Tools can't fix the world, but the people already working hard to fix the world need tools. And they need more tools than there are business models for. They need automation and, they, and the autonomy and effectiveness it can bring. What does this look like in practice? I'll give you a few representative examples. Uh, the city of Philadelphia recruited former fellows and members of Code for Philly to lead a redesign of Philly.gov. 
they transitioned from a model where every department procured its own website, which resulted in residents needing to know the organizational chart of the city to find what information they wanted, uh, to a unified design language and open source content platform driven by user research and analytics. The Unlock Philly team built a system to scrape, crowdsource, and track elevator outages at public transit stations. It turns out if you use a wheelchair and you get off the subway at a stop with a broken elevator, your day really sucks. Not only has Unlock Philly made it possible for wheelchair users to know what's going on before they leave the house, they started analyzing the data longitudinally and armed advocates with the data to actually drastically reduce elevator outages and their durations. What does the transit map look like for wheelchair users in your city? You'd probably be surprised how much smaller it is. The school budget team worked hand in hand with school district accountants to understand the open data publication of the school district of Philadelphia's $3 billion budget. Too, ma too many people surprise the administrative overhead is only a tiny sliver, less than, less than 4%. This is a little, little bit right there. It's unheard of for such a large organization. Nearly 9% though is debt services. That's all this. That's a quarter billion dollars a year of revenue we're spending to keep the district in a rocky financial position. Now this was built in only a weekend, but think about how much more the public can understand district finances now than when it only existed in a wonky spreadsheet. Can the lay people parse the budgets of the public agencies in your city? What does high availability look like for something like this? It doesn't matter if it's down for two hours, it doesn't need to auto scale, but it needs to be up 10 years from now so that someone doing this work in the future can base their work upon this. Corpot is a project originally built by fellows in Atlanta that is now a national family of efforts being carried forward by brigade groups with forks and derivatives in the works in Oklahoma, Alaska, Boise, Burlington, Sacramento, Chicago, Savannah, Toledo, Dallas, Las Vegas, Salt Lake City, and who knows where else. The idea is to get citation data out of court systems crappy websites and use it to build wizards and bots that help walk people through their options and processes. Corpot needs more modular infrastructure and services. Clear My Record is a major project of Code for America in, that they've piloted in California and are now making a huge push to help recruit and replicate or expand across the country. Uh, for the most part, it focuses on getting criminal records expunged for people charged with low-level drug offenses that have since stopped being illegal. While most jurisdictions make allowances for expungement when they decriminalize marijuana, for example, making it actually happen is a matter of connecting those affected with tools, arming public advocates with data, and things like tools to generate expungement applications in bulk. On a lighter note, Cute Pets, the Cute Pets project deploys bots that relay uh, adoptable shelter critters onto social media. So you can retweet them and heart them. All right, so it sounds like everything's pretty good, but not really. Um, what's holding Civic Tech back? Uh, well, our network is huge, but nowhere near as powerful as our numbers should make us. I, I reckon that we're only operating at about 5% effectiveness. The time invested in our infrastructure and tools is disproportionately from folks that don't have the experience you do. We've got the spirit, but when it comes to ops, it's mostly amateur hour, because everyone who knows what they're doing is tiring themselves out, putting in overtime at their day jobs, including me. So what's holding Civic Tech back? Not enough work leaves localhost. People build projects, they demo it, they shut their laptop, it's gone. At that point, no one can be inspired by it, no one can find them and get connected with them, um, no one can base a future project off of it. Beginners can't contribute to existing projects on their own. Say you see that budget visualization and you want to tweak the colors, you want to change the styles. You know CSS or you know some graphics, but uh, too often you need to know a whole stack of other things before you can even get started. We struggle to keep things online for long terms. Like that slide I first showed, online for 20 years, that's not the case for 99% of civic tech projects. They typically evaporate the second the $20 DigitalOcean coupon the team started with expires. We struggle to build upon each other's work. You know, when it, there's 76 groups around the country in different cities. Cities, for the most part, have a lot of the same problems. And when I, I, when I travel around and go to the, the hack nights that different groups have, it's remarkable how often we're solving the same problems. Um, but when you go looking to find what work other people have done, most of the time it's, it, it was on local host and it's gone, or the hosting credit's expired, um, or you can't get it running because the DevOps flow wasn't documented. Uh, dev and ops are too tightly coupled. Uh, we often see volunteer teams come together, build an application, uh, and then they deploy it, and then they operate it, and then they roll off and go work on something else, and a year later, no one knows how to run the thing anymore. 
Uh, and projects rarely provide both a first class local development and a deploy experience at the same time. We usually see projects start with a good local experience and then they shift to deploying and then another city, a team in another city comes along and no one's maintained the local dev flow in a while. And the life cycle of our projects are often longer than the life cycles of the tools we build on and the infra infrastructure we deploy on. A, a mayoral administration is four to eight years. A kid is in school for four years. An Ubuntu LTS edition is what, two, three years? Uh, for the most, too often, projects are still around and the things they depend on are long gone. And our ops are too expensive. Posterity doesn't justify 10 bucks a month per app. When you throw a virtual machine or infrastructure or a container at everything, you're left with a question every month of what's worth keeping online anymore. The answer should be everything, because this, this stuff doesn't get a lot of traffic. It, it shouldn't be that expensive. Um, but when you over-provision, you end up not keeping things in the public commons that should stay there. Habitat can transform civic technology. One of the things Habitat brings to the table is automation that follows the app. This means that anyone who can clone a project repository can run and deploy it. It means that plumbing can be buried so that someone can go, can build, run, and configure an application before they look under the hood and figure out how it works. It means that what works on one developer's machine will work on another's. It means the elimination of dependence on base images and operating system and uncouples projects from those tools' life cycles and enhances their long-term maintainability. And it means that developers and operators don't need to rely on each other. We can have a volunteer team, put something together, trans hand it off to another volunteer team, uh, and then a separate operations team can keep it running for years to come. Habitat brings deferred topology to the table. It means you can write a plan once that serves local development and online deployment. It means developers can build the Habitat model and then hand off to operators. Habitat studios offer a lightweight, portable, complete development environment and testing environments. And this is my favorite. Habitat enables an economics of optional isolation. So Docker containers alone provide dependency isolation through runtime isolation, while Habitat lets you have dependency isolation on its own. And that can be pretty significant when you're talking about this smaller scale of lots of applications. Small projects can use multiple components, yet be deployed as a single unit without the overhead of orchestration. Meta runtime containers like Emergence that I showed could spin up complete applications on demand within themselves. <coughs> Um, and, and in some ways, Habitat brings a lot of the characteristics that static websites have to projects that could make use of any sort of tools or services. We see civic hackers jumping through hoops to keep their project only on as a static website so they can deploy to GitHub pages and not worry about operations. Uh, but through Habitat, we can open the door to them using whatever the latest tools are that, that could be useful to their efforts. Um, and you could even bundle multiple apps together for an organization to run. Uh, you know, a city department doesn't need to auto scale. They might need two or three tools to help them do their job without, you know, for example, there was a startup called Formable or something that provided a great way for, uh, city agencies love this. They, they, they let them build on their own a, a form workflow. Um, they pivoted, they never open sourced it. Everyone was screwed who, who built on it. And now every, every city agency is afraid of going online. So what can you do? You could connect with a school or community group doing work you care about and help them put automation to work for their mission. You could find or start a local brigade group and help them organize their events, teach a workshop, help them up their ops game, or join a project. You could come to discourse.codeforamerica.org and find a national project doing work you care about and solve ops for them. You could help us build the civic cloud a proposed network of regional clusters that glue together public cloud vendors and local metal via software to provide resilient hosting for public interest knowledge and automation. The final thought I want to leave you all with is this, the newest rallying cry for civic hackers. We can't sit and wait for someone to come fix government in the public commons. Do you want a future where automation li makes life better for everyone? You're among the best practitioners in the world. If you only apply your skills where there's a paycheck, we won't get that world and you will never have more leverage than you do now. No one is coming, it's up to us. That's it, it's on my shirt too if you forget. I'll, uh, I'll be in the expo hall hanging out for a good bit if anyone wants to chat about any of this stuff, but any, any questions or comments or theories? Do you 
talk a little bit about the implementation of that, that looks like? Yeah, so I started building that about six years ago before like Git dominated, before containers were a thing, and so it was built, it was janky. Like it stores files in MySQL, it's gross. Um, I've moved to Habitat, and I want to rebuild the whole thing on top of Habitat. So right now, what it uses Habitat for is uh, running all the services consistently, um, bringing the, the PHP, MySQL, Nginx uh, into any container, it can run them all together, it can push them out. Um, the big advantage that Habitat offers now is that um, we can guarantee what versions of everything is on every server. Um, and what I'm looking forward to in rebuilding the whole thing on Habitat is opening the door for applications to use any sort of backends, not necessarily MySQL, but any, any language, any runtime, any database engine, anything you can turn into a Habitat package, which is basically everything, um, can be pulled into a container on demand and run. Uh, what cities are, are you all from? Southern California, Los Angeles area. Dallas? Dallas, there's, yeah, there's groups in uh, most major cities, 76. Seattle. Seattle. There's open Seattle. San yeah, there's code for San Francisco. Have you, have you seen you there? You look kind of familiar. <laughs> Salt Lake. Salt Lake? I think they have a group. Open it's STL, yeah. It's interesting that uh, Code for America is sort of solving problems that the government hasn't figured out how to solve yet. Uh, it's, it's like you're, you're sort of highlighting a need, mm -hmm. but, but solving it outside the context of the government. Like clear my record and the, the parsing of the, uh, the ticket databases. I mean, those are things that seem like they should be readily available, but the government wants people to pay their tickets to make it easy for them, right? Um, so it's, it, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, it is. I, I, like, I like how uh, Code for America is, what, you have like 700 open source repos. A little much, yeah. Are all of those tools open source, like the ones that you highlighted? Yeah, so Code for America um, prioritizes open source. Uh, they're a, a pragmatic organization, so a little like use type form to build a prototype, which Ruffles my feathers, but they get the job done. Um, yeah, it's an interesting problem because what we found is that you have to, you always have to be partnering with government and assuming good faith. Uh, build with, not for, is is one of our mantras, right? You can't show up and say, "Hey, I built you a tool and use it," because if you're not integrating with with their reality, with their constraints, with their processes, you're not actually going to accomplish anything. Um, and so, what Code for America and what a lot of groups set out to do is, is show what's possible. Um, the private sector is moving a lot faster than the government can, and for good reason, right? In, in the private sector, you've got one bottom line, which is revenue. If you, can, if, you can, if you can grow or promote revenue, then you can get a go ahead and you can keep, keep going. Um, but in government, you have many bottom lines. You have legislatures, you have constituents, you have, uh, and you have to satisfy everyone as best as possible. And your job is to take a budget and to maximize your outcome with that budget. It's, it's a very different reality, and it doesn't lend itself as well to experimenting. Um, you know, one, the, the key constraint that we found is that, for very good reason, government has been set up to be risk averse, to control risk. You know, no one wants $50 million to get blown on some new experiment, right? Um, but what that leads to is a, a, a structural inability to innovate because they can't share risk. When, when government enters into a contract, what most people want is for the representative to say, all right, well, we bought this $5 million doohickey from Oracle, and it's going to get done by this date, and it'll do all these things, and it'll fit this bill of goods. People want that nice, clean, we budget for it, we spend it, we get it cycle. But as you all know, that's not how good software gets built. It, it gets built iteratively, and it takes a measure of risk sharing rather than risk outsourcing. Um, and so that's the key mindset that has to change. And what we find is that volunteer groups and the nonprofit organizations like Code for America um, can get in there and take more risks and show what's possible and enable government to incrementally move forward. Um, and, I, and we talked about government a lot, and with Code for America and their work at the national state level, they are very government focused, but the local brigade groups, um, we don't focus on government, we, we broadly focus on our communities. That means working with nonprofits, with schools, with community organiz organizers, um, whoever is working in the public commons. Yeah. Successfully solve the problem. Are there are there any like memes? So there's like you know there's this discourse or what have you. But is there 
like a, a formalized place where you can see like, oh, this this <laughs> this city has like done interesting stuff with yeah. the old data, or this, you know. Yeah, we just. We just gained our 13th standard central place to index all the projects. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, you know, it's, it's a signal versus noise thing. And what really hurts the most for me, I think, is knowing that 90% of the work that's been done, no one will ever see. Because if you don't talk about it, you know, a lot of people set their sight on a goal. And they, the team works on a straight line to that goal. And they never stop and say, hey, let's like, write a blog post about this and do an interview and like, publicize it. Right? So the public record never gets created. Um, and that's why I think um, Habitat and this new generation of dev DevOps tools, if, if we repurpose it in the right way and make it so that they support this like slow, ad hoc, organic, handoff uh, model of development where you have a team work on something for a little while, they put it online, and then someone else comes along and works on it a little more, and then someone forks it over there, and then it, it goes back and forth. I think we can see a lot more innovation happen. Um, but the tools we're building that assume infrastructure, that assume that you're uh, you know, plugging into a, a machine and, and a persistent organization, it, it just doesn't work in this way. Um, and we're not building tools in that space. And we need to take this talent, bring it there. Well, thank you all for, for joining today. I know this was a little of a left field topic, but <laughs> It's something I'm really passionate about, and I'll be hanging out in the Expo Hall if anyone wants to chat more. <laughs>